Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very, very much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am thrilled to be here. I have long been a fan of GPPF, long before I moved to Georgia, about two and a half years ago. And I also want to tell you that I just absolutely love Georgia. I feel like my whole life's path has been headed in this direction, and finally uh, it's happened, and uh, I've been a very happy resident of this state uh, for the last two and a half years. I can draw a lot of favorable comparisons between the state I left behind, which I still love, Michigan, and the state of Georgia. Um, but that's for another time and, and another talk. Uh, I want to open with a little story that uh, has been around a while, so some of you may have heard this, but I think its message is timeless. It's a true story, and it goes back to testimony given before a congressional committee some years ago, a testimony by a developer in Louisiana who had had a lot of trouble with various levels of government as he was securing various approvals. He learned that he had to secure the approval of no fewer than 23 local and parish and state agencies before he could begin. And so he did all of that uh, with the help of his attorneys and just when he thought that everything was ready to go, he learned that he also had to apply for approval from the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington. So he and his attorney filled out all the required forms and sent them off to HUD, whereupon the agency sent back this reply. We received today your letter in closing application for your client in support of abstract of title. We have observed, however, that you have not traced the title to the property previous to 1803. Before final approval can be granted, you must trace the title prior to that year. Well, as you can imagine, he and his attorney were outraged at this example of bureaucratic foot dragging, and they fired off to HUD the following reply, which has become, in the 30 plus years since, a bit of a classic. Dear gentlemen, your letter regarding title has been received. I noted that you wished title to be traced further back than I have done. Well, I was unaware that any educated man failed to know that Louisiana was purchased from France in 1803. But he nonetheless goes on to trace the title. The next paragraph read, the title to that land was acquired by France by right of conquest from Spain. The land came into the possession of Spain by right of discovery in 1492 by an Italian sailor named Christopher Columbus. The good Queen Isabella had taken the precaution of securing the blessing of the Pope of Rome upon Columbus's voyage before she sold her jewels to help him. The Pope is the emissary of Jesus Christ, <laughs> who is the Son of God. God made the world. I think it's safe to assume that God created that part of the world known as the United States and that part of the United States known as Louisiana, and I hope the hell you're satisfied. <laughs> That's about as far back as you can trace uh, the title, I think. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about principles. Principles that are core, that are basic, that are fundamental, universal, and eternal. And yet at the same time, really rather simple. Simple but profound. And this is at a time when there's so much talk in America, has been for years now, about the need for change. Everybody's for change. Some people are for change for the sake of change. Like the guy who took to parting his hair, instead of you know this way, he started parting it from ear to ear. And somebody asked him, well, how do you like it now that you've been parting your hair from ear to ear? And he said, well, uh, it's OK, except people keep whispering into my nose. <laughs> change is on everybody's lips, everybody's mind. We're all for it because we're unhappy about something. I think we have good reason to be unhappy about a lot of things. But that should not cause us to neglect the fact that there are eternal, universal, fundamental uh, principles that should govern how we make policy and how we live our lives. So I want to talk to you about seven principles 
of sound policy. Seven. These aren't the only seven that I think should guide our thinking, but they're pretty uh, important. In fact, even though none of them will be new to you, and none of them are original with me, I picked them up from others over the years and have simply put them together in one talk with my own stories and examples, but they are extraordinarily profound. I would go so far as to say that if all seven of these principles I'm about to share with you could be enshrined in the cornerstones of every state capitol building and the federal capitol building, and more importantly, if everyone going in and out every day would not only read them, but practice them, live by them, teach and preach them, make policy according to them, there would be a lot less mischief and we'd be a far happier people uh, than we are today. That's how important these basic principles are. And the first one is free people are not equal, and equal people are not free. Free people are not equal, and equal people are not free. Now, the kind of equality I'm talking about here is not equality before the law. That's something I think everybody supports. Everybody realizes that even though we fall short of it, uh, in our history and in the present day, we should strive to achieve that. The notion that you should be judged innocent or guilty based upon whether or not you did what you're accused of, not according to such irrelevant things as uh, race or sex or place of origin or religion, that's an important principle but not at issue here. I'm talking about economic equality. Equality in terms of our incomes that we command in the marketplace, the material wealth that we possess. It's not everything in life, but it's important because it's what feeds and clothes and houses people. It's what makes for the largest portion of what we call our standard of living. So it's pretty important stuff, but I'm telling you that when people are free, they will not generate equal outcomes in the marketplace, which is another way of saying they'll not have equal incomes. And this isn't something we should lament. You hear lamentations all the time in the media and elsewhere about the gap between the rich and the poor. And although that concerns me too, I'm not so concerned about trying to narrow the gap as I am raise the, uh, uh, the level or the, the, the uh, barriers that we often put in people's way that prevent them from going as far as they could possibly go uh, through their own personal initiative. And if the result of that freedom is inequality in wealth, that's not something to lament. It's something in which we should rejoice because it's a testimony to the fact that people are being themselves. When they are free to be themselves, they will generate vast differences in incomes. And for any number of reasons. Let me just cite a few. One reason you have to expect a free people to generate different incomes in the marketplace is that their talents are different. We're not all the same in terms of our talents. Some people take a lifetime before they discover what their best and highest talent is. Another reason is our industriousness. Some people work harder, longer, smarter, better than others, and that's reflected in what they generate in the marketplace. Uh, another one is thrift. If you could equalize everybody's incomes tonight, and I, sometimes, some days I think there are people <laughs> in Washington who would love to do that if they could, but if you could equalize everybody's income tonight, if for no other reason than this third point, you would have inequality by noon tomorrow because some of us would save it and some of us would spend it. Talent, industriousness, or willingness to work, savings, these are things that generate differences of income among free people. And a fourth factor I would add, in fact, in some respects, this is the most important, is character. Our characters are different. And in fact, at FEE, we believe that the most serious problem facing this country today are not the things that are often on our lips, debts and deficits and spending. They're big enough problems, but even bigger is the erosion of character in this country that those problems, in turn, are a manifestation of. That's what happens when you lose your character. You get things like out-of-control spending, debts, and deficits. You have to fix the character problem before you can fix those issues, in our view. But differences in character, 
in terms of our personal degrees of honesty and reliability and, and patience and courage, the virtues that define strong character, we come in different packages and we're not, we don't all have the same character. And many people don't work very hard at improving it over their lives. Generally speaking, those with solid character, it's not always the case, but they tend over time to do better in the marketplace because people will trust them. So talent, industry, thrift, character, four of many reasons why you have to expect people to generate differences in income. It's the second part of this first principle that I think you, you, you really, really drives it home. Equal people are not free. If you could find a place on the planet where everybody is equal, and I don't think you will find one, you can find places in the world today and in recent history where they tried to get there, they tried to equalize everybody's income, but if you said, hey, I found a place, everybody makes the same, has the same, possesses the same, irrespective of their contribution to the marketplace, I would say without knowing anything else, that has to be a very unfree place. I wouldn't have to know anything else to be able with great confidence to say that. Because think of it, what would you have to do if your job was to make people economically equal? Could you do it by giving speeches on it? Could you get up and give speeches that uh, you know, say, hey, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't have more than the next guy, and if it looks like you're gonna have more, well then give it up so that doesn't happen. Do you think you'd get there? No, what would it take to make people equal? Well, in a word, force. You'd have to put a gun at everybody's head. You'd have to tell them now, don't excel, don't be better, don't be different, don't be there first. Don't come up with an idea that might uh, cause consumers to rush to you instead of a competitor. Is that the kind of society we'd want? Yet there are people in Washington every day of the week that talk in terms of wanting to fashion legislation so, that to, 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 so as to make people more equal. I would prefer to make them more free. And one of the results will be more for everybody. Free people are not equal and equal people are not free. So if you're, if you're one of those that is hung up on the fact that some have more than others, and if that's because of good things, not because of special favors maybe from government, but because this re is reflecting their talents, their uniqueness, their industriousness and so forth, if you're hung up on that, get over it because this is the way we were made. We were made as unique and sovereign individuals. No two people who have ever lived on this planet have been precisely the same. Otherwise, you'd, be, you'd have to say somebody lived twice. We're all different. We're all a unique bundle of attributes that make us so precious uh, and so different and so unique. The second principle, oh, by the way, if you're all wondering, is he going to take as much time on the other six as he did on the first? We'll never get out of here. <laughs> Uh, I go through the others a little quicker. The second one is, what's yours you tend to take care of? What belongs to everybody or nobody tends to fall into disrepair. What's yours you tend to take care of? I know there are plenty of exceptions, but generally speaking, this is a pretty good rule. Uh, if it's yours, you tend to take care of it. If it belongs to everybody, you know, the people's this, the people's that or if it belongs to nobody, the effect is usually the same. There's no incentive to husband it, to take care of it, to expand it, to increase it. I'll give you a good example that I know from uh, personal knowledge. I happen to have a very good friend who is presently the president of Mongolia. Anybody know the president of Mongolia? See, I'm a unique individual, even here today in this audience. I happen to know this guy. He was prime minister twice before he became president. And he visited me once in Michigan after he had uh, been prime minister once and before the second time. And I had him talk to my staff and I said, you, you've got to tell us what was it like and uh, you just completed a time as prime minister. What, what are you most proud of? And he had to tell us about having, having privatized the entire national herd of yaks, those big hairy cattle. And as he told the story, he said, we had 25 million yaks in Mongolia for 75 years under communist rule. The, the population never changed. 
they were all owned by the government. He said, when I became prime minister, I determined that yaks were not a core function of government. So he said, I sold them. We worked it out. We worked out a formula. We sold all the yaks to the various herdsmen. And when I saw him about three years later, he was prime minister again at the time. And in his office, I said, Eby, which was his nickname. I said, what's the latest on the yaks that you privatized about three years ago, and uh, he got all excited. He said, well, remember I told you there were 25 million, that's all we ever had for 75 years? He said, now, in three years, we've gone to 32 million. What was the difference? The yak uh, herders were now the owners, and in each case, they thought, this is my yak. I've, I've got to do something to take care of him. Maybe if I've got a male yak, I'll go find a female yak so I can have more yaks. And <laughs> In three years' time, they went from 25 to 32 million. This makes all the difference in the world. If it's not yours, you just don't take as good a care of it. If it belongs to everybody, we all have an incentive to use it and abuse it, but little interest or incentive to take care of it. So this is an important principle. It really establishes the vitality, the critical nature of private property. If you want to take the scarce resources of any society and very quickly and very thoroughly trash them, just take them from the people who created them or, or who, to whom they belong and pass them out to those who didn't create them and uh, who don't own them or to whom they don't belong. Just redistribute it. And in no time at all, I guarantee you, those scarce resources will become far scarcer. What's yours, you tend to take care of. If it belongs to somebody else, Usually you just, how many of you here have washed a rental car? <laughs> well, you wash your own car, why don't you wash your own? You see the difference? I mean, even that is owned by somebody, but it, you're the user of it. You have a reason to use it, but not an incentive to care for it very much. A third principle, sound policy consists of looking at the long run and all people, not just the short run and a few people. Sound policy requires us to think of the long run and all people, not just the short run and a few. Oh, how much mischief have we gotten ourselves into by the failure to understand and to practice this principle? How many things have we wound up in, whether it be here in Georgia or uh, far more so in Washington, thinking that, well, at least for the short run, this will do somebody some good, and then later we find that now it's doing us all a great deal of harm. That really describes the last 50 years of the growth of the American welfare state. Things that started out with the best of intentions and everybody thought, well, you know, this is going to help uh, some people. But I wonder how much of what we cranked up we'd not do if we could turn the clock back and think of the long run in all people. I wonder how different those th differently those, we might view those things if we had more properly thought of the long run and the effects on all people. The example I often like to use is of a thief who goes door to door uh, in uh, a neighborhood. He gathers all the loot that he can get his hands on and then he goes to the local shopping mall and spends it in one store after another. If you, f if you follow up with that and take a tour of the shopping mall and interview the shopkeepers, you're going to hear a lot of praise for this guy, aren't you? You're going to hear people say, well, I don't know where he got the money, but boy, help me. I hope he comes back. I'll hire more people if he comes back enough. Would you be thorough in your thinking if you concluded, based on those interviews, that, hey, this guy was a public benefactor. He stimulated the economy. No, he wouldn't be thorough at all. You would be ignoring the people from whom the money was taken. They're exactly uh, the, the same to the same degree poorer as the people he spent the money on uh, may be now richer. This is redistribution through theft. It's not the creation of wealth. So we have to be thorough in our thinking. That's what this uh, principle really requires us to do. It asks us, don't base policy or decisions solely on what something might do for a handful of people or even a large number in the short run without thinking about what the long run consequences might be for everybody. Take a look at it all because it might change your mind. A fourth principle is if you encourage something, you get less of it. I'm sorry, more of it, more of it, sorry. 
So I, I, you might have thought I just came from the White House. If you encourage something, <laughs> you get more of it. If you discourage something, you get less of it. Isn't it interesting in Washington how they don't quite understand this? They think if, if we keep raising taxes on cigarettes, that'll deter smoking. That'll make people smoke less. But they don't think that if we keep raising taxes on wealth creation, that it will have a similar deterrent effect on wealth creation. They think that, the, like sheep, we'll just line up to be sheared and go on our merry way and do things as we always have before. But uh, this principle tells us that we're creatures of incentives and disincentives. You can take a good people and make them a bad people just by the incentives you put in front of them, by making uh, bad behavior rewarded and good behavior penalized. That's the story, really, of uh, the great society. I think the verdict is pretty much in on that since Lyndon Johnson crack, cranked it up in the mid-60s. We spent more than $5 trillion on great society programs that were started in the mid-60s. And poverty has not declined. As Ronald Reagan said, we waged a war on poverty, and poverty won because we didn't consider incentives. We broke families apart because we paid them to break apart. And we discouraged the creation of the very jobs that would have benefited the very people that we wanted to help. So you have to consider incentives and what kind of incentive structure you're creating or tearing down by uh, the policies you pass. A fifth principle is nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. This is really another way of restating the uh, principle number two about private property. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. The late economist Milton Friedman elaborated on this, and he said, really, when you think about it, there are only four ways to spend money. Only four ways. One way is you spend your money on yourself. He says a direct connection between the person who earned the wealth, the person who is spending the wealth, and the person receiving the benefits of the spending. It's the same person. You spend your money on yourself. You'll make mistakes from time to time, but by and large, this is the most efficient way to spend. Because the connection between the earner, the spender, and the recipient of the benefits is as tight as it gets. It's the same person. Second way to spend is you spend your money on someone else. You buy a wedding gift for someone. This is why we have uh, bridal registries now, so uh, bride and groom don't get 20 toasters. You have an incentive to be thoughtful because you know the people. It's your money. You won't, don't want to spend too much. Uh, but you really don't know what they want and what they need and what they have as well as you do uh, uh, those things when it comes to yourself. So there's a, plenty of room for inefficiency and waste in that second way of spending. Another way to spend is somebody else spends your money to buy something for you. Or another way to put that would be, um, this is really the same thing, you go to lunch on an expense account. It's kind of an indirect restatement of that. You go to lunch on an expense account. Uh, you've got another party here. You're spending somebody else's money on yourself for your lunch. You have an incentive not to order more than you can eat. But you might tend to go for the lobster instead of the hamburger if somebody else is picking up the tab. Well, the fourth and only other way to spend money is when somebody spends somebody else's money on yet someone else. No connection between the earner, the spender, and the recipient of the benefits of the spending. Somebody else, somebody spends somebody else's money on yet someone else. Would you agree that the potential for abuse is greatest in that fourth way of spending, right? It's natural. It's not a commentary on the spender as being a bad person. It's just the incentive structure just isn't right. Well, which of those four ways of spending describes what governments do? You legislators. Number four, right? So just naturally, by its very nature, this is one of the many reasons why I think our founding fathers wanted to keep government small, small, because they knew that by its very essence, it involves 
certain people spending other people's money, usually on someone else. The next principle, number six, has two parts to it. And it gets really down to brass tacks with regard to government itself. I've mentioned government. This is really specific to it. It's a two-parter, and it says, government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. In other words, it's not a fountain of free goodies. And a government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you've got. Think of that. Government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. And there's a trade-off here. A government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you've got. I heard a story years ago from a friend, now deceased, who uh, I thought came up with a way of explaining this better than anybody, especially the second part of this. He talked about a band of wild hogs that lived along a bend of a river in some corner of the Deep South. And this group of wild hogs, he said, was a stubborn, ornery, independent, self-reliant bunch. They had survived floods and freezes and fires and droughts and hunters and dogs, you name it. Nobody thought that these wild hogs could ever be rounded up or captured. A stranger came into town one day, not far from where the hogs were. He went into the general store and he said, tell me, to the storekeeper, where I can find the hogs. I have a plan to pen them up. And the storekeeper laughed at him and said, well, you'll never do that. But he nonetheless gave him some general directions. And off the stranger went with nothing but a few sacks of corn, an axe, and a one-horse wagon. And a few months later, he came back into town, went into the store, and said, I've got them all penned up, up near the swamp. I need some help to bring the hogs out. The storekeeper couldn't believe it. And others came from miles around to hear the story of how this guy had penned the hogs that everybody thought could never be captured. He said, well, it was really rather simple. At first, I made a clearing at the center of the forest with my ax. And then I put some of the corn at the center of the clearing. And for the first few days, none of, the, none of the hogs would come out and take any. But after a while, the younger ones came out, grabbed some of the corn, and scampered back into the underbrush. And before long, the older ones came out, taking the corn uh, regularly as I put it in the clearing. They stopped grubbing for roots and for acorns on their own. And some of the older ones thought that if they didn't get their share, another hog would get his share in his place. So they all were taking it. And he said, it was about that time that I began to build a fence around the clearing, a little higher each day. And at the right place, he said, I built a trap door. And at the right moment, I sprung it. And his last line was, naturally, they squealed and hollered when they knew I had them. But I can pen any animal on the face of this earth if I can first get him to depend on me for a free handout. That describes a lot in world history, and even in our recent history, I do believe. The final principle I want to share with you is, in some ways, maybe the most important of them all. And it is, liberty makes all the difference in the world. Liberty makes all the difference in the world. For a country that was founded on the principles of liberty, it's odd, isn't it, that barely 200 years after that fact, we find ourselves so often having to raise it and explain it to large numbers of people who don't know the first thing about it, who take it for granted. That's a sad commentary in and of itself. But liberty, this very special thing that we have had in this country and that is also slipping away before our very eyes. When you think about the people who have lived on this planet more than six billion today. Who knows how many more if you could add them all up who've ever lived. I think it's fair to say that a fairly small single digit percentage of all the people who've ever lived could say that they lived under any measurable degree of liberty. Most have been serfs or slaves or in some way answerable on every matter to the lord of the manor or the king of the realm. Many people in society weren't even permitted to own uh, the tiniest bits of property that would give them opportunities to express themselves. 
So those who have had liberty are really a pretty small group. We're among them. That should tell us a few things. It should alarm us, too. It should tell us that liberty is pretty important stuff. It's worth committing ourselves to, sacrificing for. There's nothing about it that, that, that's automatic or guaranteed. There's nothing about liberty that says that because our forefathers had it that our children will automatically have it. It has to be believed in. It has to be practiced. It has to be fought for. It has to be taught, preached, and practiced at all costs. So many people in our country today, I think, sadly, are willing to sacrifice it, usually one bit at a time. Most people who have lost liberties don't lose it in one fell swoop. Uh, they lose it by salami tactics, one slice at a time. And so many people today are willing to sacrifice a little liberty for something that's really nothing more than a short-term gratification. But this is pretty important stuff. So I would like to end by saying that as you craft policy or decide as private citizens where you will stand on public policies, elevate the principle of liberty to one of the key factors in making your judgments because it makes all the difference in the world. Think of the people in the world today who don't have it. Think of what it must be like to live in a place like North Korea where liberty probably is, uh, where there are, there's less of it than perhaps in any other part of the world. Without liberty, life itself is hardly worth living. That's how important it is. I want to close by sharing with you a story from one of those trips to Behind the Iron Curtain that uh, Kelly referred to. This uh, comes from 1986, when I spent a couple of weeks uh, in Poland, when Poland was in the middle of that very dark decade, before the big changes in 1989, which saw the fall of the Eastern European Empire of the Soviet Union, and after the imposition of martial law in December of 81, uh, when you know, the world for many months wondered if the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies might invade Poland in the late 70s and early 80s to put a stop to this thing called solidarity that uh, had taken flight and was uh, in which people were expressing themselves and demanding personal liberties. In the end, the Warsaw Pact did not invade, but the communist government in Warsaw did its dirty work and clamped down, jailed people by the thousands, brought out the, the police and the water cannons and, and uh, suppressed freedom in Poland for that most of the rest of that decade. In 1986, I spent a couple weeks with people who were active in the underground resistance uh, to the communist regime. I was intrigued by the, the extent to which these people would go on behalf of liberty. You could say to them, you're up against the Army, Navy, and the Air Force of one of the world's two superpowers. How can you ever hope to prevail? Why don't you just give up? Didn't matter to them. Liberty meant everything to them. One evening, I spent uh, some time with underground printers, and they brought out stacks of material they had illegally translated, great works of freedom from the West, that they had illegally translated and printed and were distributing in Poland. And I asked them, where do you guys get all the paper for this? The government owns all the printing presses. And a young man named Pavel said, well, we get it from two places. One, we smuggle it in from the West, and two, we steal it from communists. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, the government has its own factories where they make their magazines and newspapers, their propaganda, but a lot of the workers there now think like we do. And when the coast is clear, they take the government's paper, smuggle it out into our hands, and sometimes even print our stuff from the government's own printing presses. But the story I want to leave you with comes from another evening of that trip uh, with a couple named uh, Zbigniew and Sofia Romashevsky. Underground radio for solidarity uh, for six months after martial law was declared in December of 81 and until they were both arrested in the middle of 82 he was given four years in prison she was given three and there in November of 86 I was in their apartment neither one had been out of prison all that long and they were active again on behalf of liberty for Poland not in radio but in other ways and we talked that evening about 
what it was like to run an underground radio. And I asked many questions, uh, but at one point I said, well, how did you know if people were listening? And Sophia answered in a very matter-of-fact way. She said, well, we wondered that too. We could only broadcast for eight or 10 minutes at a time. And then we had to go off the air to avoid detection and go someplace else, set it up again, and broadcast eight or 10 and move on again. Uh, they were ultimately detected and arrested. And I, I pressed her. I said, well, were people listening? How did you know? And she said, well, one night we asked people while we were broadcasting, if you believe in liberty for Poland, in the message of this radio, will you please blink your lights and call your friends whom you know to be of the same view and ask them to do the same. And she said, we then went to the window and for hours, all of Warsaw was blinking. Liberty meant everything to those people because they knew what it was like to have it taken away. So liberty is important. And our central task at this critical juncture in our history as a free people, I think, is to rekindle those fires in the hearts and minds of our fellow countrymen about why it's so special and why it's worth sacrificing for. Why you have to read about it, learn about it, practice it. Make sure that it's passed on to the next generation. Because if we don't, it will disappear. Thanks to the Georgia Public Policy Foundation for its good work on behalf of Liberty and to all of you for whatever you are doing and whenever you do it on behalf of Liberty, all I would say is do more. Thank you so much for being uh, so kind.